If you're here today, there's something running through your mind that you want to do. There is no reason for you to be here today unless there's something running through your mind that you want to do. How many people here are over 40 years old? Raise your hands. Raise them high. Raise high. Don't be scared. Raise high. There's no, Jesus Christ, this is a young crowd. For the very small percentage of us here that are over 40, what, thanks brother. There's like eight of us, bro. For like the 11 of us, look, here, here's, this is a lot of fun. I'm, for the 11 of us, we lived life before this. We were grown. We were grown ups already before the internet came. I was 18 years old. I'd lived my life, at least the childhood part of my life, without the internet. The biggest thing that excites me, especially in a mature internet market like here, WhatsApp and Facebook and, Link and Instagram and YouTube and Spotify, like there's so much opportunity and you don't even have to leave your home there was no building your life you know after hours when I was growing up when you had a job and you had to take care of something you didn't then start another job because it was late but now this allows it I, the biggest thing that I want to get across in this little moment of this speech is everybody in here is taking this for granted your grandparents your great-grandparents your great-great-grandparents they didn't have this if you aren't succeeding or attacking your success with this in your hand, then what are you doing? Every single person here has the opportunity to create a profile and a presence online, whether it's yourself or your business or your idea, and the cost is zero. I love when people get mad when Facebook or Instagram's organic reach goes down. I keep reminding them it's free. How many people here are on Instagram? Raise your hand. Over the next year or two, Instagram's reach is gonna go down because more ads are gonna go in. So as you can imagine, I'm so passionate to get you to post three or four times a day, not once a day, yet everybody overthinks their posts so much because they're so scared not to get as many likes as they did last time. <laughs> It's true, it's 100% true. The amount of people here who wanna post something but retake it 53 times <laughs> or change the filter or things of that nature or my favorite move, you post it but in the first 83 seconds you don't get enough likes and you remove it. <laughs> It's a fascinating thing for me to watch because what it speaks to is, in my opinion, people being confused about the game. I view the game macro. I watch most people play micro. You're not in the business of getting likes on Instagram, yet you're pandering to the machine of that. You're in the business of creating awareness for whatever you want. You want people to know what you want them to know, whatever that may be. Business, raise money for a charity, sell something, become a personal brand, you know, whatever Whatever it might be, whatever it might be, that's what you want, yet people get so caught up in the semantics. Listen, what I can tell you from my career is this repeats over and over and over again. In 2006, I started one of the first YouTube shows, period. It was the longest show on YouTube when I launched it. YouTube wasn't even a year old. I sat in front of a camera and I drank wine for 30 minutes and a lot of people watched it. A year later, Twitter came out and I was one of the first people to move on that. I invested because I got smarter at that point, but I also was one of the first people to amass a million followers on that platform. Before I did YouTube and Twitter, a year or two earlier in America and many other parts of the world, MySpace had won and dominated, and there were people that won on that platform. If you pay attention to what happened on MySpace, if you pay attention to what happened on YouTube, if you pay attention to what happened on Twitter and then Facebook and then Vine and on and on and on, it's all the same game. In the beginning, if you move quickly, you can get more attention. Most people get frustrated that they aren't first and then they don't go all in because they think they missed it. However, winning on these platforms is a game of being better, not first. Being better comes in two ways. This is where it gets very important, my friends. Getting, being better on putting out content only comes out in two ways. Either entertainment, right, or information. If you are putting out content on these websites and trying to 
grow you, and you want to succeed and build an audience, you either do information, you know what you're talking about, whether it's painting nails, business, wine, sneakers, hair care, I don't care what it is. You either know or you entertain. Entertainment comes in a lot of ways. This is playing out on Instagram. Entertainment comes in being funny. Entertainment comes in being musical. Entertainment and escapism comes in being attractive, being a model. It all plays. If you're lucky enough to have both, it gets really crazy. But if you do not do one or the other, you lose. If you go look at your Instagram account right now and look at the last 10 posts, my question to you is very simple. Did you post those posts for your audience so they could be entertained or informed? Or did you post it for yourself for your own self-esteem or insecurities. Let me save you time. You posted it for yourself. The biggest takeaway that you could have from here, in my opinion, is a couple things. Number one, you are very fortunate to live in a country with disproportionate advances on these platforms. When I look at the data of how much attention is on this device and those six platforms in this country and the size of this country, it is staggering. This is one of the best places in the world to produce content for YouTube, Spotify, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It's one of the best places in the world. As... See, you did it again. You clapped for yourself. Oh, actually, fun fact. Actually, back to this amazing place and the internet and apps. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you know this, but I was actually one of the first five investors in Path, which was a huge app here for a long period of time before it shut down a year ago. So because I was an early investor in Path and because this became the biggest market for Path four or five years ago, I spent a lot of time paying attention to this market from far away. And what I can tell you is this, the beauty of the people that live here, and there's so much, you know, it's funny, there's so much amazingness. You know, in the world that I see, and see, how many people here consume my content? Raise your hand. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, so, if you do, you have a good sense of me. You can imagine why I love Indonesia so much. All the love and optimism and warmth plays out here. But the biggest thing that I'm passionate about is getting people to be less insecure and care less about what people think, especially their parents, plays out here too. And so, for me, it's a really interesting market to look at with trends and how people do things and what they respond to and who they follow and why. And so what I can tell you is if you are capable, if you are capable to be strong enough internally to start posting on these platforms more truth, more your truth, you, your truth, you will see a remarkable return on that investment in this market. So we spent a minute each on those. So basically three minutes each, three and a third minutes each and we're done, all right? How many want to try, right? Then let's do it. So before you do, Stand up, shake your body out, and if you're gonna relax, the fastest way to relax is first push yourself to a high level of energy, then it allows you to drop deeper. So find a partner and go, I own ya. So, so I'm a guy, I appreciate every facet, every phase, what some may consider to be success, failure, opposition, ups, downs. I appreciate every facet of life, and I firmly believe that life is the greatest classroom. Right, And when I encounter situations, my perspective goes to a place of, okay, life, what are you trying to teach me right now? But it wasn't always in that space until the year of 2006 when I was at the University of Tennessee pursuing this dream to go to the NFL, which I soon find out it didn't just stay for National Football League. It also stood for not for long. But when I was pursuing this dream to happen and manifest, in one moment, I lost everything I had been working for my whole life. And the next day when I woke up, my life has never been the same ever again, right? And so when it happened, not only did it alter my life, God stepped in, used the situation to alter my perspective. And so I look at people, situations, places, and things, I view it differently, right? And so I landed in Seattle a couple of months ago around midnight, right? An amazing thing happened. I land in Seattle. A gentleman picks me up from the airport and we ride to my hotel. And when I get out of the car, I say to the gentleman, man, thanks a lot. I greatly appreciate it. And he says to me, no problem. I just want to let you know, I'll be the guy that's coming back to pick you up in the morning. I said, okay, great. What time would you like for me to be down? He says, 715. I said, great, I'll see you then. The next morning I come down, we greet each other, we get in the car, we're riding to the venue that I'm scheduled to speak, and maybe five minutes into the trip, I look up and I look in the mirror and the gentleman is crying his eyes out. And I say to him, 
sir, is everything okay? And he responds, I want to paint a picture for you. He said, my normal job is not in transportation. I'm not a driver. He said, my buddy owns the company. He said, whenever he gets overwhelmed with shifts, he'll call me and say, hey, man, can you cover a shift? And usually I'll do it because we do a lot of work with the Seattle Seahawks. And so when I drop a guy off, I'll go on the computer, look him up. Pretty cool experience. He said, so naturally, when I dropped you off last night, I went on the computer at my house. I started to look you up. And he said, I saw a video about redirection and I saw a video about perspective. And he said, the reason I'm crying is because I just lost my wife. My wife just died. He said, and I've been living my life thinking, surely there's nothing else that can bring me the passion, the energy, the fuel, the driving force that my wife once brought me. Surely there's nothing else as purposeful as my wife to make me get up and give everything I got to everything I'm a part of. And he said, when I saw the video, it's not that it could replace my wife because nothing could ever replace my wife. He said, but when I saw the video, the amazing thing it did was it altered my perspective and it gave me a new sense of energy. I said, great. I said, man, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, you said you had two kids, right? He said, yep. I said, okay, cool. Could you tell me at a basic level in the midst of the opposition, how did you get up every single day, put one foot in front of the other, go out of the door, carry on in your career and raise your other two children in the midst of the adversity? Can you tell me when you took the blow, you had to absorb the blow. How did you get up every single day and still look at life with some sort of energy and do what you had to do, right? Because the quote says it, you judge the character of a person not by where they stand in times of comfort and convenience. You judge the character of a person by where they stand in times of challenges and controversy. Mike Tyson said it best. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Like everybody is on fire for the Lord until opposition happens or when the situation or the circumstances change and they don't get what they expected to get. And so I wanted to understand in the midst of the opposition, how did you get up and how did you carry on and stay committed to your family and to your career? And he said to me, I have to be honest with you. Follow me. He said, my wife had been sick for 30 years. He said she was wheelchair bound. He said the situation in our household had gotten so toxic that every single day we would get up and when we would meet each other in the living room, we would just bicker, argue, fuss, say certain things to each other to the point to where I couldn't take it anymore. And I called one of my buddies and said, I'm leaving. Can I come and stay with you? He said, sure, man, come on. He said, I left. I packed a little night bag, I get to my buddy's house, I get up the next morning, I'm in the mirror, and I'm brushing my teeth, and as I'm brushing my teeth, he said he's saying to himself, for rich or for poor, yeah, we've been pretty poor, for better or for worse, yeah, things have gotten pretty worse, through sickness and health, and he stopped, put his toothbrush in his bag, zipped it up, and he said when he looked in the mirror, the conviction said to him, you didn't finish. So you didn't do what you said you were going to do. You didn't stand in the pocket how you said you were going to stand it. You didn't be the man that you told her you were going to be. You were all good when it was all good. But when things started to go south, you weren't the man that you said you were going to. You didn't fulfill your promise. And he said the conviction took him right back to his home. And when he walked in the door at his home, his wife was sitting there in the wheelchair. And as soon as he walked through the door, she said, what are you doing here? And he said she started giving it to him. And he said to her, I deserve it. Get it out. Say everything you got to say to me. And he said when she finished, he told her, I just want you to know I'm never leaving again. I'll never go anywhere, right? No matter how tough it gets, no matter how rough it gets, no matter how bad it gets, I just want you to know I'm going to stand in the pocket and I'm going to be here as your husband. I said, can I ask you another question? He said, sure. I said, if you can go back, shift the situation, change anything about it, what would you do differently? He said, it's easy. He said, I would have shifted my perspective and I would have embraced the opposition a lot earlier. He said, because the moment my perspective shifted, not only did my disposition switch, it shifted my whole household. He said, the funny thing is, because of our perspective, we didn't view the opposition as opposition anymore. We started to view the opposition in adversity as an opportunity. I said, bingo. I said, because I'm a firm believer that perspective drives performance every day of the week. How an individual view what they do will always affect how they do what they do, right? The amazing thing about it is I love the game of football, right? I loved everything about it. I was a part of something to where I can inflict violence and not get in trouble for it. Sign me up every day of the week, right? I loved every bit of it. 
but I understood very early that the game of football was kind of like this stage. It was a platform that God had provided for me to cultivate a certain level of excellence and greatness so that one day when I could no longer play the game, it was certain things I could extract from it to apply to other areas and aspects of my life to make me somewhat of a decent human being. And so the most amazing thing about it was I had a coach, I was just texting him backstage, he changed my life, right? When I was coming up inner city Atlanta, born to my mother at 16, in a two-bedroom home with 14 people, and I had this dream to go to the NFL, but I didn't have the resources, and I was stuck playing tackle football in the street. And I saw a guy that paid for not only me and my three cousins, he paid for kids all across Atlanta, and he didn't want anything in return. And one day when I got the opportunity to ask him a question, because he had to drop me off at home after practice, and my mother was working a double shift at Wendy's. And I'll never forget, I got out of his truck, and my house was 125 Warren Street at the time. And when I got out, I said, Coach, man, I really appreciate it. He said, all right, Inc., I'll see you tomorrow. I said, can I ask you something? He said, sure. I said, why do you do what you do? And he opened his door, got got out of his truck, walked around, stood directly in front of me. And I'll never forget, he said to me, son, I'm going to share something with you, and I don't want you to ever forget it. He said, as long as you can make sure that somebody else's life is okay, he said, son, God will always make sure that your life is okay. And he got in his truck and he left. And so it was hard for me to understand when we played the game of football, how could an individual be a part of an institution and not give everything they had to it if they were doing it for the glory of God? It was hard for me to understand how if a person had somebody that they loved and they cared about, how could they not push them to get the best out of them if they were doing it for the glory of God and they viewed it in a certain light. And so when I got to the University of Tennessee, I'm going to be honest, it was Mayberry for me. I was like, man, y'all get smoothies. Like you get steak, shrimp, and spaghetti. Like guys today are spoiled, right? They got their own barbershop, right? They got AC in their lockers, right? They got nap pods, pods where they could be walking and stop and take a nap. Pods, nap pods. Na- Listen to me for a moment, nap pods. Where they could just be walking and it's like a nap pod. You're tired, you could go take a nap. Nap pod. It blows my mind, right? And I had two meetings, and then these two meetings, the job of the meetings was to get a sense of direction of what I wanted to accomplish. And so in one meeting, I said, okay, I want to graduate in three years, and I want to go to the NFL. They said, well, Inky, you didn't just knock out your testing. I said, I get that, but I really want to help my family. And we had a scrimmage, and I'll never forget our first scrimmage, and I was so excited. I was so hyped. I'm an undersized guy. I'm passionate about the game. I want to give everything I got to it. I have a great scrimmage, right? I'm talking trash. I was a big trash talker, right? Clean trash, but I was a big trash talker. And our chaplain, who now works with the Tennessee Titans, James Mitchell, was present. And when we broke it down and we were walking off the field and I was carrying my pads, and he said, hey, come here. And I jogged over to him and said, hey, man, how you doing? He said, I want you to meet me in my office in the morning. You, you talking a little crazy. I said, all right, cool. And the next morning, I go to see him and I sit down in his office. I said, hey, man, Mitch, how you doing? Like, hey, man, I'm great. I said, what's up, man? What's the meeting about? He said, I want to disciple you. I said, what is that? I said, that sounds hard. He said, yeah, I want to disciple you, like spiritually. I want to go deep with you. I want to help you develop. He said, like when you have meetings with football, like position meetings, I want you to meet with me prior to the meeting, and I want to be able to give you homework, and I want to make you sacrifice and abstain for certain things. I want to help you develop spiritually. That's what discipleship is. I want to go deeper with you. I said, okay, can you give me a second? I want to go talk to my roommates and see, can they do this with me and walk with me because I want a certain level of accountability. He said, yeah, go talk to them. I go talk to my roommates. At the time, it was Gerard Mayo. Went first round, 10 pick to the Patriots. Now he's the Patriots linebacker's coach. It was Robert Ayers. He went first round, 18 pick to the Denver Broncos. It was Ramon Foster, he's starting for the Pittsburgh Steelers still until his day, and he went free agent. He's been starting for him ever since he got in the league. And I went to him and I said, hey man, here's the deal. He wants to walk with us spiritually. Are you guys down? He was like, yeah, let's do it. I said, I get it. We want to be great athletes, but I think we want to be well-rounded as men as well. And this could be really beneficial and we can hold each other accountable. When one guy gets weak, another guy can step up and help him out. Can we do this? He was like, yeah, let's do it. Right? In the first meeting, we tried it just to see how serious he was. He gave us some homework. We showed up to the meeting. None of us did the homework. He had us look up some scripture. We walk in and we sit down. He was like, you got your work? We were like, nope. He was like, get out. He was like, come on, man. Like, let's go through the lesson. He was like, no, get out. And when we walked out, I'll never forget, Mayo said, oh, he wasn't playing. I was like, no, he's not playing. 
right? And the next meeting, we showed up and we had everything. We would be in the complex at 4.30 in the morning, going over scripture. We'd be in the complex at 4.30 in the morning with our Bibles open, and Mitch was challenging us. We'd be in the 4.30 in the morning, and he was talking to us about abstaining from sex. We'd be there at 4.30 in the morning. He will be talking to us about different challenges and how to lead our teammates.
the one thing, whether or not this is a dream or not, is becomes irrelevant. The only thing that matters, if it is a dream, is whether you can realize what the essence of the dream is. Consciousness. And you can only realize that directly, here and now, as this. Oh. Descartes, of course, the French philosopher, said, I think, therefore I am. If he had waited a little bit longer before saying anything, <clears throat> he could have come to the point of cessation of thinking, and then he could have made the more profound statement, I am conscious, therefore I am. Thinking is only an expression of consciousness, a surface expression of consciousness. So th this realization of, we could call inner stillness, of spaciousness, of presence, of, well, there's a term that's very popular these days and that's a good thing, it's called mindfulness, which I use almost never <clears throat> except when I explain why I don't use it <laughs> I don't use it because it seems to imply that your mind is full but it's not what mindfulness is you, it really should be called mind emptiness <clears throat> the the entire practice of, for example, people find certain esoteric spiritual practices very strange and hard to understand. Zen is one of those. People say, what, what does it all mean? What's Zen all about? Cessation of thinking without loss of consciousness. That's what the Zen masters are trying to show you non-conceptually. As the Zen master became famous because when he was asked, please explain the meaning of Zen, all he would do is raise his finger and look at you. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> and I was in the, I've been in the monastery for 15 years for that. Yes. Sometimes it takes a long time before realizing that it doesn't take time to know who you are. <laughs> That's a paradox. So I'm not saying don't go to a Zen monastery. Perhaps you have to. <laughs> it may take time to realize that it does not take time, but it doesn't have to take time. It's here and now. I'm saying this to especially the spiritual seeker, seekers among you who have it, made it your life purpose to seek whatever it is, the ultimate spiritual experience or transformation, and the very seeking has become, without you knowing it, the greatest obstacle to spiritual realization. I th I, first of all, I, I, one of the things about the global pandemic that I said to my staff and to my family the moment I heard how the circumstances in the world changed, I just said I refuse to be a victim uh, to these circumstances. So, a victim consciousness is when um, we allow something in our outer environment to control the way we feel and think. So if I say to you, Jay, why are you so upset today? And you said, oh, it's because of this person or circumstance. What you're really saying is something in my outer environment, some person or some condition is controlling the way I think and feel. Now that's not the truth. That's just a response, right? So anything that controls our thoughts and feelings uh, causes us to be victim to those things. And the stronger the emotion we feel to some circumstance in our life, the more we pay attention to it. And where we place our attention is where we place our energy. So we're giving our life force, we're giving our power away to that circumstance. And so I just made up my mind that uh, it was a great opportunity to get into the cocoon. And I don't think I've been healthier uh, in my life. I mean, I'm usually on six different uh, time zones in four weeks, uh, uh, running a lot of events, as you said. but. But I saw it as an opportunity to really self-reflect, to really immerse myself into my own personal work, uh, to uh, redo our website, to redo our brand, to uh, connect more with my staff, to cook my own meals again and work out and, and use my body and do uh, my walking meditations on the beach and of course um, 
Uh, I've had a I've had a fabulous, fabulous uh, uh, nine months or so. Uh, but I think you know, um, I think one of the challenges I think many people have is really the discernment of information. Uh, it's really difficult to, to know what's the truth anymore, just because information is so accessible. And I used to say that in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. And and now we have to confront a whole nother level, and that is the information that we're getting. Uh, is it is it actually supporting us, or is it something that really is an incentive to to cause us to make choices? So, um, for me, I think the biggest challenge has been just really an awakening to what kind of information I want to expose myself to, and I and I think it's now more than ever a challenge for a lot of people in the world. So I'm going to talk to you today about a different way of looking at what real is. It's not easy to figure out what real is because we don't really have infinite knowledge and so we're always making some sets of presuppositions about what's most real. And it really matters what you assume is most real because you base the decisions that you make that run the entire course of your life on those assumptions whether you recognize it or not. And if you get the assumptions wrong or even if you leave them incomplete, you're going to pay a big price for it. And uh, the assumptions that we use in our culture, although they've enabled us to develop a tremendously potent technology, are incomplete in ways that have also cost us and that are extremely dangerous. And since the scientific age began, we've lived in a universe where the bottom strata of reality is considered to be something that's dead, like dirt, it's like it's matter, it's objective, it's external, and there isn't any element of it that lends any reality to phenomena like meaning or purpose. That's all been relegated to the subjective and in some ways to the illusory, but it's by no means self-evident that that set of presuppositions is correct because we lack infinite knowledge and there's many things about the structure of being that we don't understand the main one being consciousness we can't account for it at all and we can't account for the role it appears to play in the transformation of potential into actuality which is a role that's been recognized by physicists for almost a hundred years now and which remains one of the biggest unsolved mysteries in science there are other ways of looking at what's real and these other ways have some advantages, and one of the advantages they have is that they protect us, knowing these other ways of, of operating within reality, defining reality, protect us from certain kinds of pathologies. And modern people are prone to a, a fair number of pathologies that stem from uh, assumptions of, their, of, their, of the systems they use to define reality. And one of those pathologies is uh, kind of a nihilistic hopelessness, which is a consequence of the recognition that in the final analysis, nothing really has any meaning. And because life is difficult, and that's a meaning that you can't escape, being forced to abandon your belief in a positive or a transcendent meaning can leave you weak at the times when you really can least afford to be weak. Every thought that I have started with a question. What's wrong with me? Let me tell you what happens when you ask that question. That question will attract a million answers. The moment you say, what's wrong with me? The devil has a list, everything. He'll show you everything from your genetics to your jawline to everything. I mean, he'll just take everything. But your questions direct the integrity of your thoughts. The struggle is in your mind. Slept eight hours and you wake up still tired. Your mind has been in turmoil all night long. You've been wrestling in your sleep. Your body went to sleep, but your mind is still caught up in a warfare. Your mind is the battleground. I want to give you the heads up. 
never question God. When you're about to transition from one career move, one relationship, or one situation to the next, it's because you've got every confirmation in the world that it's your season to transition from where you are to where you're looking to be. Don't underestimate yourself. You do what you can do, and God will do what you can't do. Take the initiative. Throw your net on the other side. Be ambitious. Reach. Ask for help. Not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong. And expect things to get better for you. Just because people let you down, don't give up on God who never will. Just because you lost a job, don't stop trusting that God is my provider. When someone closes a door in your face, God allows them to close the door in your face. All God wants you to do is walk up the hall, because I can promise you he got a better door that he wants you to go through than the one that got shut in your face. That's a fact. The door is closed for a reason. Because God just wants you to walk up the hall because he got another door. And when you open it and get behind it, you ain't going to believe what's back there. But you will never get to it if you stand in front of that door crying. God is the creator of all doors. I'm just going to see what else he got for me. You think things are going to just go your way? Well, they're not going to just go your way. You got to make them go your way. You think things are going to just happen for you? Well, they're not just going to happen for you. You got to make them happen. So I want to challenge you to waste no more effort wrestling with other people. Your destiny, your future is not predicated on the decision of someone else. You've wasted too much of your life trying to change other people's mind about you. It doesn't matter what they think about you. God is not going to bless you by their opinion. God is going to bless you by how you see yourself. Just start acting like you're blessed, talking like you're blessed, thinking like you're blessed, dressing like you're blessed. If you will put actions behind your faith, one day you will see that become a reality. You cannot go around thinking that you've reached your limits. You're going to become what you believe. You are fully equipped. It may not have happened in your past, but it can happen in your future. Now, I'm asking you to go get what belongs to you. You are blessed. You are prosperous. Start acting like it, talking like it, dreaming like it. People who have not accepted greatness for themselves, these people don't study, ladies and gentlemen. They don't have time for personal growth and development. They don't have time to work on their minds. People can affect us. Our peers can affect us. Our environment can affect us just working consciously to overcome the poverty consciousness, the feeling constantly of saying you deserve this. There's no need for you to be afraid. It's not too good to be true. It's true because you've earned it. Why do we care so much about people who don't care about us. That won't be there in the hard times, that won't be there when you hit rock bottom, that won't be there in your struggle, that never call you and ask you how you doing, that never calls you and asks you or checks on you to see if you need something. Why do we care about what they think? We all go through disappointments and things that are not fair. It's easy to hold on to the hurts, and think about what they said. We get up in the morning, it's the first thing that comes to mind. We don't realize how much that's affecting us, draining our energy, limiting our creativity. If you're going to fulfill your destiny, you have to get good at letting things go. See, your unwillingness to forgive another person is like you sipping the poison, waiting on them to die. Forgiveness is for you. You can't drive your car looking in the rearview mirror. You can't. There's a reason why the rearview mirror is this big and the windshield is this big. If you keep looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to keep crashing your car. Have you ever noticed that when your faith is the strongest, you come up under the greatest attack? Because every time the devil senses that you're about to walk into who you be 
and he's trying to stop you from doing it. Slap somebody and say, just do it. Be great before it's too late. Being in a great house does not make you great. It's one thing to have great parents, but that doesn't make you great. And they said it's possible to be in a great house, but you not be great. So being in a great house does not ensure that you'll become great. How can you keep your mind on what you're trying to do? How can you make the choice of discipline over procrastination? How can you keep an attitude of doing it all and doing it now? How can you stay focused on your ambitions? You can keep your focus on your work or you'll find yourself distracted. Distracted by negative thoughts, distracted by negative people, and pretty soon, depending on the type of people you've associated with, distracted by your doubts within yourself. Even when you face rejection, even when you face failure, you make a decision. I will remain in the grind. I'm not backing down. I'm called to make a difference. Greatness is not immediate. This is so important. In other words, greatness takes time to develop. Greatness is not immediate. You got to stay with it. You got to stay at it. You got to keep working on it. We give up too quickly. You map out, you think, you strategize, you change up your team, ready for the opportunity to present itself. Most of y'all are impatient. If it doesn't happen as fast as you want it to happen, you say maybe it wasn't meant to be. God will never give you something somebody else is supposed to have. I want you to write this down. There are two powers in life that every one of us have to deal with every day that you can never control or stop is time and change. You cannot control time. You cannot control change. What's at the core of achieving the good life? The major key to the good life. It is not in mastering the attributes of leadership. Every day in a thousand different ways, we are trying to improve ourselves by learning how to do things. We spend a lifetime gathering knowledge in classrooms and in experiences. Self-approval. That's a very challenging area. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where most people get stuck. That's a stage that a lot of people get there and they never move out of that area. Why? Many things can contribute to our not approving our dreams, our not feeling good enough. A lot of things can contribute to that. Many of us never live up to our potential or don't approve ourselves because we never had anybody to believe in us. And because your doing doesn't come from the deeper place of being, it hasn't worked for you. If you're trying to find out who you are by doing things, you will never find out who you are by doing. You have to start with being because the difference between the two determines the direction of your destiny. I need to embrace the suffering. You know, there's something powerful that once you just sort of embrace the fact that in order to achieve something big, you've got to get rid of these distractions, you're probably going to have to have some suffering to get there or some sacrifice to get there. And so once you've embraced and decided that this suffering, this sacrifice you're making is an indicator of progress, suffering and sacrifice and hard work is an indication of progress towards our dreams. so easy so easy to put things off so easy to say you're gonna do it tomorrow well I want you to reprogram your brain and tell yourself that tomorrow is not a viable option you do it today you get it done today that's what you do the journey is just the pieces that you have to go through and you get to choose to enjoy those pieces to have fun during those pieces 
because you know you're going to come out the other end being the person you wanted to be. And you're going to see it before everybody else does. That I can guarantee you. When we go around dwelling on these negative, defeated thoughts, we are sending poison down through our system. We are telling our command center, the mind, this incredible tool God's given us to release defeat, failure, mediocrity. I wish for you that you might develop a growing awareness of the world around you and your possibilities in it. Develop a sense of history and destiny and be grateful for the opportunity that you have to participate in that grand endeavor. Start the daily action of first cleaning up all your current situations. Remember, little achievement lead to confidence that conquers guilt. Then buy up every challenge to reach your goal. You can now handle it. The winter, the spring, the harvest, the inspiration from it all, and the immediate and future progress that will someday give you a view from the top of your goals, your adventure, and your achievement. When you get up in the morning, no matter how you feel, you need to say, I am strong, healthy, energetic. I have discipline and self-control. I look good, I feel good, I think good, I smell good. Some of you, if you would do that, your mind would go tilt, tilt, tilt. It would think, what in the world are they saying? It would send an alert all through your system saying, hang on guys, we're changing directions. Don't send out any more defeat. This is a new day. Send out health, send out healing, send out strength, vitality, victory. You've got to get your command center sending out the right instructions. The people that are going to be successful are willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. What is it that most people won't do? Here's what they won't do. Learn something new. They're comfortable with what they're doing now. Learn something new. You need to learn how to control your own destiny. Be your own boss. That's what time it is. Most of the time, your challenge is you're not solving it quickly enough. You're not getting totally certain. Certainty is so huge. Flood yourself with certainty. And then most people don't understand. You can obliterate most problems with just massive action. I see people hem and haw and make excuses all the time when challenges arise. And it would have just been solved if you'd have decided you'd have been totally certain and you'd obliterate that problem with some massive action. How great to have a mind to expand and a soul to nourish, to have hands that can feel, a heart that can experience, a soul that can soar, a mind that can inquire and learn, a body that can respond, to know love, sadness, hope, disappointment, accomplishment, failure, thrills, appreciation, wonder, frustration, confidence, courage, impatience, contentment, expectation, fulfillment, beauty, and harmony. To have all this happen to one is one thing. To know it is all happening is much more. What stress really is when a problem comes up is the fear of loss. And what you do is you begin to give this a disempowering meaning and you begin to feel like you're going to lose something which is why having a process means so much to me because when I know I have a process to solve a problem, I'm so much less fearful of the loss or the stress that it's going to cause me. When you begin to get these feelings, it's where your focus is going that's causing this stress level to rise in you. And my hallucination for many of you is that when a problem arises, you begin to focus on the problem more than the solution. You begin to magnify your stress level, make a disempowering meaning, which is this fear you're going to lose something, if you're still wounded over a position you lost, you'll go to that new company, defensive, not friendly. You're treating them based on what you've been through, but they had nothing to do with it. It's much more freeing when you learn to let things go. God will be your vindicator. He'll take care of who did you wrong. It's not your job to pay people back. They hurt you once. Don't let them continue to hurt you by holding on to it. It's easy to say, I have a dream. That's easy. You can say that when the enthusiasm is there. You can say that when you have enough money in the bank. But I'm telling you, it's hard to say, 
I still have a dream. I still have a dream. Can't you say that after your friends turn on you? And after the people that you're doing it for stop believing? Discouragement is deadly. It can get you off track. When you have a setback and you get discouraged, you can get set on the shelf. We all get discouraged. It's powerful. Uh, it is universal. It involves everybody. And it is recurring. It doesn't just happen one time in your life. Many of us never, ever discover our greatness because we become sidetracked by secondary activity. We start doing so many things, we just give our time away until we don't have any time for ourselves or any time to do the things that we want to do. I'm saying to you that one day you look around and there goes a year, there goes two years, there goes three years. So is there something you want to do? Do it now. A man's life consists in how he managed time and change. We become what we are as a result of how we use time and how we manage the changes in our lives. Our mind comes as standard equipment at birth, and things that are given to us for nothing we place little value on. Things that we pay money for, we value. The paradox is that exactly the reverse is true. Everything that's really worthwhile in life came to us free. Our mind, our body, our hopes, our dreams, our ambitions, our intelligence, all these priceless possessions are free, but the things that cost us money are actually very cheap and can be replaced at any time. Use your power to create a new beginning for yourself. Find something that you love. I didn't come here to work for someone else. I came here to live my calling. A job is what you get paid for. A calling is what you're made for. I invested in myself. I couldn't afford to do it, but I couldn't afford not to do it. All disciplines carry through to affect all parts of our lives. If we're disciplined in just one area and lazy in another, guess what? The bad habits in one area of our life will eventually destroy our self-discipline in the areas we've been working on. Discipline is a set of standards which we've selected as a personal code of conduct. Discipline is the mind being trained to control our lives. Discipline is imposing on ourselves the requirements for honoring these standards. The most fatal deterrent to self-confidence is guilt. Not doing all you know how to do to the full extent of your present ability weakens the foundation for confidence. The biggest part of worry comes from the lack of this personal confidence. And lack of confidence comes from two major things. First, no goals or plans. And second, no daily discipline to achieve. So listen to the voices of creative experience. Let nature, experience, wisdom speak to you and teach you. Remember, both opportunity and challenge await action. You can work on micro habits with regards to your conscientiousness. And I think the best micro habits set up some aims for yourself goals that you actually value. It helps you do a situational analysis of your life more than a psychological analysis, I would say. And so, so the questions are something like, well, you're going to have to put some effort into your life. We become what we think about. Conversely, the man who has no goal, who doesn't know where he's going and whose thoughts must therefore be thoughts of confusion and anxiety and fear and worry, becomes what he thinks about. And if he thinks about nothing, he becomes nothing. Motivation is its kind of a strange word. We think it means that we're fired up to do something and passionate to make something happen. Because you just can't turn on passion. You can't just turn on the desire to execute a task. Be certain of one thing. Every exaggeration of the truth, once detected by others, destroys our credibility and makes all that we say and do suspect. The tendency to exaggerate, distort, or even withhold the truth is an inherent part of all of us. It starts when we're kids, and then it continues when we're adults. 
exaggerating our net worth to impress old friends, exaggerating how close we are to closing a deal to impress the boss. If you make it to the end of this video, I want you to write, I am determined to reach my goals. I am determined to reach my goals.